So uh, let's move on to another topic. Uh, uh, you've, you've written a few articles this week, Evan, about uh, some governments that uh, are uh, considering regulations of Bitcoin. Um, Canada, for instance, has decided to regulate Bitcoin. Um, while other countries have decided not to. Can you uh, expand on, on uh, what Canada is going to do about regulations? Yeah, this uh, well, this week there's been a lot of regulation talk this week from, you know, Canada, Canada, Japan, uh, Switzerland. And I didn't write an art, I didn't get a chance to write an article about this, but, um, but Sweden, the Swedish... Uh, not this, not this, uh, yeah, the yeah, Swedish uh, central bank released a report on Bitcoin, and uh, they they said that Bitcoin was really important, but it wasn't, uh, the, you know, the the Bitcoin economy wasn't big enough to have any uh, immediate significant impact on on their on the mainstream economy, so that they they aren't really worried about regulating it. Hmm, okay, didn't get a chance to write an article about that. But Canada, you asked me about Canada. Um, yeah. They, they're not, uh, they're not writing legislation uh, specifically dedicated to Bitcoin. They've just passed an amendment to an existing law. Uh, it's the Proceeds of Crime and Terrorist Financing Act of two thousand. Okay. And um, they've almost sounds like the that. Patriot Act from America. <laughs> They've they've amended that to um, to include Bitcoin along with all the other cryptocurrencies and virtual currency in general. Okay. Um, and basically, what it is is that um, the people, Bitcoin companies like um, you know like exchanges like Coinbase, Bitstamp, or or RoboCoin, you know, um, mm -hmm. if if your business is uh, dealing in the buying and selling of Bitcoin, you know you're you're not like you're not like a good seller manufacturer. You're you're a financial institution. You know, if you're one of these businesses, you have to now be compliant with um, with Canadian financial regulations. Oh, okay. So, okay. so, so it's kind of like they're they're just updating their finance laws to include Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and stuff. Yeah. Kind of the same way that America, uh, we had those Senate hearings back in November where the senators wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, if Bitcoin's fine, you know, uh, we don't need to regulate it necessarily. We don't need to uh, really write any new laws or anything. But um, we just want to make sure that the people who are operating in this space are obeying and complying with all these anti-money laundering laws and know your customer laws and stuff like that. So is that basically what Canada's trying to do in their country? Yeah, the the Bitcoin companies they're gonna have to um, they're gonna have to register with uh, I can't remember the name of it. It's some bureau, you know, like financial bureau to prevent you know uh, financial crime and things like that. Yeah, and um, you know there'll be like a licensure registration things like that, and so. Um, and really, uh, you know, the market pressure fucked this. You know, really, this uh, this amendment to the legislation is not that important because um, the companies, you know, the companies that this would affect, they've already ran into this problem in in, um, in other countries that have similar legislation. So you know, they're already working to be compliant with these laws. They're used to so it. So it's not really going to have a huge impact, but. Um, it is pretty significant because we do have a country that's uh, trying to, you know, regulate Bitcoin. Uh huh. It, and it also kind of reminds me of um, what California has been trying to do in their state government lately. Uh, they just, the legislature just passed um, a bill that would basically declare Bitcoin and other digital currencies as lawful money. Um, meaning it's not illegal. They just want to clarify that it's not illegal because there used to be a certain institute in the Corporations Code of California um, that basically said that no one's allowed to create their own, their own currency. Mm -hmm. So uh, the legislators, you know, in California, they love the fact that uh, 
it's the state of technology and and a lot of um it drives their economy basically so the le- the politicians want to make sure that they be seen as uh, friendly to digital currency and the whole bitcoin um industry so that's why they're kind of trying to make sure that like the law seems friendly towards it and they're they're it's it's not even really a new law they wrote they just basically passed um uh, it's it's kind of like amending the corporation's code. They just struck out that one line that kind of makes it seem like Bitcoin might be illegal. So um, it's pretty interesting to see different governments' uh, takes on this issue and how they're all kind kind of trying to approach it with different um, different mindsets and different approaches to it. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely um I definitely respect the Canadian uh, government for. Because, you know, they're, they're trying to legitimize Bitcoin. You know, they want people to use it. Um, so, you know, I, I give them respect for that. But at the same time, this regulation, it's just... Um, overall, I, th- I think it's negative for for the Bitcoin economy. Really? Because um, the all these, you know, registration requirements and things like that, it's just going to make it so expensive... Uh, yeah. to register yeah. your your company so um, really all this is doing is it's uh, restricting future competition so you know now uh, you know like five years from now it, it the only the only two exchanges that might be able to uh, do any business at all in Canada might be bitstamp and coinbase because you know those are the two biggest ones right yeah, yeah. There are two of and, the biggest ones. And Coinbase is in San Francisco, so like that's that's um what what is what does Canada actually have in terms of exchanges? Oh, well, um well, I don't know if Canada has any like uh exchanges based out of Canada, but this um but this amendment it applies to any business uh doing any kind of activity in Canada. So it doesn't matter where you're based out of. Like if if somebody lives in Canada and buys and buys Bitcoin uh, from Coinbase or sells on Coinbase, uh, then technically Coinbase is doing business in Canada, so they have wow. to be compliant with Canadian financial law. Wow, that is totally yeah. insane. Yeah, it's really weird, um, but apparently, you know, this it's happening in a lot of other places. I mean, yeah, how do they strictly... how do they expect people to to comply with that? That's ridiculous. I mean, in the age of the internet. Um, you you can't restrict people like that from 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 doing business with with companies in other countries, you know, especially an, a fellow neighboring country that speaks the same language as you. Like yeah, exactly. It's 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 unnecessarily restrictive. It yeah, like. like um, you know, like like Coinbase and Bitstamp, you know, they're gonna be able to do it because they got really rich before it was regulated. But mm. you know, five mm. five years from now, you know when Coinbase, you know, has a monopoly on the Canadian exchange uh, market. Um, there won't be any newcomers who'll be able to afford to do this because you know they're going to have minimum starting capital, obviously yeah. being a startup, and they're going to have to spend all this time and money on uh, becoming compliant with the regulations. So, um, really, it's kind of dangerous because you know you, you're. You're manipulating the law so that, and it's an unintentional consequence, of course. But you're restricting competition. What happens if the only exchanges who can afford to be compliant with these laws? What happens if they become the ne- the next Mt. Gox? You know, yeah. that's going to be some pretty big trouble. That like that'll be pretty bad news if that happens. Yeah. That would make that would make not not only the part of the Bitcoin industry look bad again with negative press the whole mount gox fiasco all over again but it would look make the government look bad too because like these are supposed to be the businesses that are regulated and are, are complying with the laws mm-hmm. and everything these were the government approved businesses. yeah government approved like stamp approval from the politicians and then if it fails anyway which it can because regulations aren't perfect and are often too crippling then um <laughs> It'll it'll make the government look pretty stupid for having not been able to prevent that. Right, and this this is what I think about Mount Gox. Uh, you know, the Mount Gox crash happened uh, while you know this and and in the era before governments you know even really considered Bitcoin 
as you know a substantial threat. So there was you know very minimal regulation. So there you know, so there's like a million other exchanges. Yeah. So when Mount so when Mount Gox crashed, you know it, you know if people were able to get their funds from Mount Gox, you know I know like a lot of people lost everything. Um, but one, if you were able to get your funds out of Mount Gox, you could have put them in another exchange. And two, um, there wasn't really there was a lot of fear. Obviously, the price dropped by uh, went from like a thousand to what was it, like three hundred dollars oh. or something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think at but, one point on Mount Gox itself, it, it said like a hundred and thirty or something really low like that yeah. when it was re- died but, um, right away. But you know, it, it, the people the the people in the Bitcoin community weren't completely hopeless because they had all these alternatives. Yeah, you know. So I so I I think that if Mount Gox was the only exchange and it crashed, Bitcoin would be dead right now. Mm. That's what mm. that's what um, the governments who are enacting these kind of uh, regulations that's what they're setting the Bitcoin economy up for in the future. Huh. Because. Huh. Um, there's only going to be a handful of exchanges who can who can afford uh, to do this, um, who can afford to be compliant. So if one crashes, uh, it's going to have a really nasty effect on uh, the confidence of Bitcoin, which of course has an effect on its value. Yeah, um, that's an effect of uh, centralization, right? Basically, having centralized um, infrastructure. If you only have a couple of exchanges. Um, because of uh, crippling regulations that are put in place by the government, and uh, like that would basically serve to make the infrastructure itself more centralized. If there's a couple points of failure in the entire system, and if those get knocked out, if another Mount Gox happens again, ne- I mean negligent management or whatever it is, thievery, whatever, uh, then take out that one point of failure, and boom, you, you it, it it like. I wouldn't say it would kill Bitcoin because Bitcoin itself will still exist. The network will still still exist. It'll just be really a lot harder to trade them and such. We'll be back into the dark ages, basically. Like, you know, mm-hmm. back four years ago in Bitcoin's history. So, like, it it would just it would just hurt it. It would seriously set it back. Um, you know, a couple years, and we would have to build back up again. So, yeah, I think that, like, yeah. We're we're getting to a point where people in the community, if they really care about seeing this experiment succeed, um, we need to fight centralization on all fronts. And this government regulation stuff, uh, some of it is harmless, but then other examples can actually serve to centralize Bitcoin more. And we need to be wary of that. I mean, I don't live in Canada, so I can't, you know, really... Uh, I can't even really affect the politicians there. But you know, the people living in Canada, you gotta you gotta speak up. Make sure your politicians are representing you. Make sure they don't ruin Bitcoin uh, for your country. Yeah, and so yeah, that's that. Those are the long term uh, effects that the centralization will have um, on Bitcoin. But right now, you know, this Canadian legislation had no effect on the price, um, and. Uh, the other two stories, Japan and uh, and Switzerland, they both decided to not regulate okay. Bitcoin for the um, for the same reason, or did they did they reach that for uh, based on different evidence? Uh, Switzerland said that there's no need to make new legislation because any Bitcoin business um, already falls under standing financial law uh, because okay. I think Switzerland treats it as a currency. Um, you know, a, a currency equal in quality to you know fiat currency. So huh. they're saying, look, it's money. Um, so it's already it's already covered by our financial laws. Okay. Japan, they I have to look right quick because I wrote it almost a week ago. Now, I mean, Japan. That's that's um, a big deal because obviously that's where Mount Gox was headquartered. Yeah, that's where Mount Gox is. So, common sense would um, suggest that Japan would want to regulate Bitcoin because the most high-profile failure of any Bitcoin-related business happened there in Japan. 
and tons of people around the world lost money in that situation. So it's kind of it's interesting that Japan decided not to regulate it. You know, is that because they think they can handle all of the issues with the current um, financial laws that they have in place? Yeah, um, well, I'm looking at the article I wrote, and um, from what I can tell from my article, another report might have something different. Um, they didn't really state a reason. Um, basically, what happened was um, a representative from the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the dominating political party in Japan, just announced that um, they've they've been, you know mulling it over trying to decide if they want to regulate or not and you know the, and this representative from the LDP came out the other day and he said uh, quote unquote basically we concluded that we will for now avoid a move towards legal regulation and uh, from what I found that's pretty much all they said oh okay um, that's pretty still that's still vague then though yeah you know, they could still regulate soon if they wanted yeah to. but for but for now, it's going to remain unregulated, and um, it could be for the same reasons. Maybe they're, maybe they're getting ready to say that. Well, you know, it's it's money, so it it's already covered by our financial rules. Yeah. Um. But maybe also they just don't. I don't know why they would think this because Mount Gox is such a huge deal. But maybe they just think that Bitcoin really isn't important enough to warrant uh, regulation. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, like, I can see regulation actually having um, a positive impact on, um, well, re what, what, what regulation is supposed to do, ideally, is prevent bad people from, you know, screwing you over. Uh, like Mark Carfilis, you know, this guy, either through negligence or through, you know, backhanded thievery, um everyone's coins vanished from Mt. Gox and now he's going through court proceedings to uh, try and declare bankruptcy for Mt. Gox and everything. Now, if the government actually wanted to put smart regulations in place, they would put something in place where they could possibly um, hire like forensic investigators to analyze the, the blockchain and try and figure out exactly where the Gox coins went. Um, now, we already have some people trying to do that online on 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 Reddit and such, trying to do you know uh, armchair investigations into the blockchain. But you know, imagine imagine um, a, a government like Japan actually investing some hard money into trying to analyze the blockchain. All the information is there that you need, and investing enough to analyze it and figure out exactly what Mark Carpolis did with those coins. Now that, that would be some really interesting uh, regulation that could really help uh, the the case, you know? Right. Well, that's an interesting point because I think that that's a pretty good example of how um, governments, they can, you know, they can never, they can never act proactively you know that they, yeah, they always yeah. they always are reactive um they respond to things after they happen and uh so yeah like they could try to figure out what mark carpal is did um but if they try to employ that same methodology to pre to prevent crime then you get into you know privacy violation things and like and, mm -hmm. and, and things mm -hmm. like that um and that's a whole another can but, of worms right there so, and, and to to prevent things like this, the government really can't do anything. Uh, so what they do is they just, um, and plus, you know, they're, they're a monopoly. The governments don't have any competition. So they're, they're only worried about uh, getting votes instead mm -hmm. of like, you know, actually solving a problem. Mm -hmm. so, what, so what they do is they, um, so they just remove any risk. You know, like we, re we recognize Bitcoin is very dangerous, so we're going to have this... Um, we're going to have this government-backed insurance fund where if you lose anything on an exchange, we're going to refund you. You know, So um, they basically, pretty much all they can do is remove personal responsibility 
which makes things mm. worse. And um, and they would do that because that would get them more votes from the population. Yeah. We don't want to think yeah. for oh, themselves. Hey, the, gov- the government cares about us. They're going to give me money if I lose my if I make a bad choice on yeah. the Bitcoin exchange. So I'm going to vote for them. But you know, really, the only way the problem is going to get solved is um, competing exchanges trying to uh, satisfy their customers and make them feel safe. Um, and so they're going to do things proactively and solve problems before they happen, uh, which is something that is unique to the private sector. The government can never do that because they don't have that kind of foresight. Um, because they, because they only, they only re- react to things after they happen, because they respond to the reactions of people. Right? Private yeah. sector companies. They they're able to solve problems before they happen because their job is to uh, is to create things that people want before they even know that they want them. Right. That's how entrepreneurs make profit. Yeah. So so their goal is not to respond to the reactions of people is to make sure that the people don't have these negative reactions to begin with. Yeah. And, and that's just something that the government has no interest in doing. Damn. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. You know, I, I think, uh, a lot of people, um, kind of go about society with the assumption that the government has their back or at least has the intention of having their back, you know, and that, that it will protect them. But, um, it's a, it's a, it's a bloated bureaucracy. I can't speak about Japan specifically, but I know here in America, it's ridiculous. The bureaucracy is insane. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard for those agencies to have foresight when all they do is react to problems that, that have happened in the past. So yeah, it's maybe, maybe decentralized, um, infrastructure will eventually help make governments more efficient. That's uh, or irrelevant, or or irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll uh, that'll that'll probably happen. They probably won't like that though. They don't, they won't no, like feeling irrelevant. They'll fight that definitely.